you being you, it's been a, it's it is a wonderful place to be. Oh, am I being? <laughs> He's putting me on. Um, but you have a special gift. You are a welcoming community, and what you do really makes a difference in the world. No matter where you are, is this the 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 people who come from Morningside? <laughs> How can I tell? <laughs> You're all together. I think that's great. Um, so I just want to say that uh, I continue to pray for you, for who you are, where you are, where you are going, um, that you might be blessed in all, in all ways. So I just wanted to say that this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. My name is Eulis. I'm the contemporary worship leader here. Uh, I wanted to just take a moment to remind you to turn off your cell phones, quiet your hearts, open yourself to God's word as Lynette leads us in our prelude.
Good morning, FPC. It's so good to be together. My name is Michelle Danley, and I'm Director of Spiritual Formation here at the church. I'm so glad you've taken this time to come together and worship. God bless you. Welcome all of, the, of you that are there online, also joining us from the comfort of your homes. We hope today also blesses you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Before we get going, I want to invite all of you to stand and to greet each other. Let us remember the hallelujahs and the mystery of it all and say hello to all your friends. Good morning. What a glorious season, how we're so reminded of the greatest love and gift of all. Hallelujah. Let's raise up our hallelujahs today and worship. I'm so excited to worship together. Before I share some quick announcements, I want to say a special, special thank you to Pastor Robin Clardy. Robin, thank you for your preaching the last couple weeks. We were so blessed by you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to let you know next Saturday is our Easter fair. It starts at 1 o'clock and it goes till 3.30. This is all outside. It's an all-family affair. It's for all of you. And it's the greatest time to invite a neighbor or another family. There's a live petting zoo, a jumpy house, food, music. We're even going to make resurrection eggs with the children. So we welcome you to come be a part. We still need more help even with setup and running the event. And we welcome you. And the exciting thing is, is we open up Camp VBS registration at one o'clock next Saturday. So we hope that children are blessed in all kinds of ways, as well as all the families. Please join us. I want to also share with you that on Easter Sunday, we'll, we, we will be running two services simultaneously. It's a new thing for us that we're trying out. We're going to have a 930 service here. It'll be more traditional music and all of the wonderful Easter elements. And then over in Fellowship Hall, we will be having what you call a fellowship service. It's a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more um, what I call contemporary music and some very creative elements. All families are asked to stay together on Easter, but we do offer childcare for the nursery for ages birth through three with an RSVP. But come and join us, and we have a fun little surprise celebration on the patio after. I heard it involves donuts. <laughs> so come and join us, and we also will have an opportunity for your family to take a picture together. So please join us. That's 9.30 on Easter Sunday. Um, also a great thing to know, we do have valet parking during Easter Sunday. You can, your, par, your car can be um, right. They're going to pick up valet parking at Barris and Casablanca. And we have valet parking and the cars will be parked over at the local school. 
That is a free valet parking. We want to make it easy for everyone. And we're asking, please, please be conscious about keeping our main parking lot open for people that just need a little extra special time on getting in. Perhaps they have a walker or they're just a little um, slower on their feet. We want it to be easy for all of them. So try and keep that parking lot open if you could for, for them. Thank you. Um, and the exciting news is Pastor Jeff Bridgman will be here preaching on Easter Sunday. So, and he's preaching both services. So it's really exciting. He'll be here. He's going to be with you. And then he's going over to Fellowship Hall to also uh, preach the Easter sermon. Please join us. And please, please, it's the greatest time to invite a friend. All right, let us continue to worship. Thank you again for being here. Good morning once again, everyone. We're going to continue in worship with a song called Jesus Loves Me. I was lost. I was in chains. The world had a hold of me. My heart was a stone. I was covered in shame. When he came for me, I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loves me. He loves me. He is for Deep in my soul. 
Oh, God, how I need you. Sing, Lord, I need you. 
a seat, everybody. I said before the service, uh, I think half of the people were here. Uh, I want to say how lovely it has been these uh, four weeks to be with you. You've really shown me a lot of love and joy and gratitude. And uh, I had said earlier to the group that you are, you're an amazing group of people who make a difference in the world even in the one place that you are. I think it was Mother Teresa who said, we can't all do great things, but we can do small things in great ways. This morning, we continue on in the Gospel of John. John 15, one through 17, hear the word of God. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is the Lord's the Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no, uh, no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. The word of the Lord. Over these four weeks, as we have traveled quite a distance in the Gospel of John, we are in a short amount of time in Jesus' life. We read the words and we hear sequential sermons, but it's a very small time. And in that time that Jesus has with the disciples, he wastes no moments. As I have said before, he knows where he is going. This is the last chapter of what is known as the farewell discourse. Jesus is 
saying goodbye to his disciples, yet knowing that he will remain with them, but not in the way that they have become familiar with. So today we come to a a passage that we are aware of. I am the vine, you are the branches. And as I have said in previous weeks, we need to slow this down to get the context. Yes, we have a vine and we have grapes. And we have grapevine that is withering because it has been cut off the branch. But if we don't slow down to take in all the little pieces that Jesus is actually saying and the context in which he is saying, we might not get all the fruit of what he's saying. The context is, he's, as he continues in this farewell discourse, he is showing and talking about things that are familiar, whether it is washing of feet or grapes and grapevines. These men were very familiar with this, but he is turning it on its head. These men know the Hebrew scriptures that say that the people of God are the vine. They're the vine. And throughout the Hebrew scriptures, they are called like a vine that goes astray and not bearing fruit. And Jesus comes to his disciples and says, Israel is not, the Jews are not the vine, I am the true vine. So he is shifting their connection from what and who they were all about saying this is is the new economy. Jesus is going to say, this is who you are. This is whose you are. This is what you are to do. And this is how you are to do it. It is important. Anybody who owns a business or has a vision, a mission statement, you have to figure these elements out. Jesus is giving them their identity. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you are about. He is, he's helping them be grounded. How many of us fall in the trap of being human beings? I'm, I'm doing things. I'm doing things. I'm a human doer. If you're a type A person like nobody we know, you know, we're the Marthas instead of the Marys. We're always doing things. But Jesus has to tell his disciples who they are because what their trajectory is, what they are going to be about in spreading the kingdom, they will not be able to do it unless they know who they are. And so Jesus is telling them, this is the relationship. You need to stay connected to me. You need to stay connected to the vine. Because if you don't, this, you are going to wither up and you are going to be of no service. If you are not connected to the vine, you won't have fruit. These men, their whole lives would have seen these people, the, the, the grape farmers, their whole life. They would see terrace after terrace after terrace of grapes growing. Grapes are hard 
to grow in that they take a lot of tending. If you want to produce good fruit from a grapevine, you have to tend to it. And where these grapes were grown, it wasn't in green, lush places. They would terrace hillsides. And they would have to take the rocks out of the hillsides. And as they took out the rocks, there would be crevices between, between those rocks and there was good soil. Because especially at the bottom parts of these terraces, as the rain came, the soil would come and gather together around the rocks. And so they'd clean out the rocks. They would clean out all of the, the vegetation, the weeds. And then they would take a stump and they would put it in that good soil. And they would, they would tend to the soil, but they would not do anything to make it grow fruit for a couple of years. They would let it become established, let the roots become established. Grape vines can last up to 125 years and more. And my husband and I had, a, had an experience, I see your smile, Daryl, where if you want to know how valuable one grapevine is that's mature, we were in a, a balloon ride in Napa. I surprised my husband. I'm not the adventurous one, he is. So for an anniversary gift, I... I bought us two seats or two places to stand in this, this balloon, and I am terrified of heights. But there is something so magical, and I was not afraid at all. We, we got onto this, this balloon, and we were the last balloon to, to, to go up. And to watch those balloons fill up, and go up, and we were over Napa, looking at the grapevines. And I, I love grapes in that they're beautiful. They're just, they're just beautiful, that's me. But we're over the grapevines, and the wind was carrying us away. So the pilot of this, this balloon couldn't just drop us down. We were supposed to drop down in a specific place. But we weren't able to because we kept on going. And I was happy because I, we got an extra 45 minutes. <laughs> so as we were coming down, and, and there's a whole crew on the ground because they have to take the ropes and pull you, guide you down so that you are safe. We landed in a vineyard. And... As we were hovering, it felt like inches, but I'm sure it was feet, over the grapes. That pilot was a, a bit concerned because we found out after we landed in a patch in the vineyard. And I believe it, this is, if you ruin one of those vines, it's $20,000 because you have to pay for all the grapes, it will grow in its lifetime. So make note, if you're in a balloon, just make sure your pilot knows this. And, and we found out because the owner watched this balloon and she came running to the balloon. I don't know why, she, but I guess when the balloons go up, she, she's vigilant. She ran to make sure we did not land on any of her vines. So Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. And what we find in this passage is a lot of dance back and forth between key words. Remain, remain in me in 17 verses nine times, that you are the branches, six times, 
talking about bearing fruit nine times. Love or loved 12 times. And commands five times. Those words have a relationship to one another. And Jesus is saying, as you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Who are they? Whose are they? What are they to do? And how are they to do it? So Jesus is saying later on in this passage, I no longer call you servant because a servant doesn't know what the master is about. But I call you friend because everything the father has told me I have shared with you. Take that in. God the Father, everything God the Father has spoken to God the Son. God the Son has told the disciples. Relationship. He's now shifting. Not only is he shifting the understanding that, that he is the vine and not as the Hebrew scriptures had described the people of God being the vine. No, there's a new thing happening. Jesus is the vine. And we are the branches. And we are friends of God. So if you go to the Greek and do the play on words, love is agape. Friend is philo, philo. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And that word friend is a very intimate word. I imagine and I hope that everyone in here has a couple friends that are intimate, that you feel like you can share everything with. And if you can feel what that's like, the love you have for your friends, the way you experience who you are when you are in relationship with these people. That's a snapshot, just a tidbit of what Jesus is saying to these disciples, you are my friends. That is the foundation. They are in relationship with Jesus and that is never going to end. Those are the roots that have gone deep into the soil of their being. Three years. A, a grapevine is supposed to be left, I understand, for three years before you work on it to bear fruit. The disciples have been with Jesus for three years. And if they stop and realize the, the roots that have gone down into their very soul, so that when Jesus is physically not there with them, they have that relationship to, to draw back on. When they are persecuted, when they are attacked, when they are destitute, they can call on the name of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Not unlike us today. That as the roots of our relationship with Jesus go deep into our souls. And when things happen to us. We can draw upon the fact that we know who we are. And because we know who we are, we know whose we are. These disciples had to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they belonged to Jesus. That when Pentecost, and they had not experienced that yet, but as they will experience Pentecost, then they will 
feel the fullness of the, the Spirit of God within them. Who they are, whose they are. And I could not miss this where it talks, Jesus says, a friend will lay down his life for you. Jesus is talking about going to the cross, that he will go that far in relationship to show these disciples how much love he has for them and for the world. And I could not get the image of Ukraine out of my mind. Interview after interview. We are Ukrainians. This is who we are. And I would say I've seen a lot of them in, in uh, TV or in uh, videos or written. They know whose they are. You see them in churches. You see them praying. They are people of deep faith. And they know what they're about. They are laying down their lives for, for their friends, for their loved ones. So these disciples won't know until it happens that Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying, I will lay down my life for you. That's how much I love you. And what are you to do? Jesus says you are to bear fruit. And as you remain in me, it says you, you are clean because you have heard my word. There, the sense of clean is, is to, be, to be pruned. Now there's a, different way in which you can interpret cut off. Some interpretations say you just cut off that branch and throw it away. And there's another thing that vine growers do. Those who grow grapes. And in, in Israel, in, in all the places that the disciples would have seen grapes, they would grow on the ground. It wasn't until later that the Romans started doing the trellises that we see. But they would let those grapevines grow along the ground. And then every once in a while, they might put a pole up where the grapes are growing. And you'll have to come up later on and see that there are baby grapes here. It's a new uh, brand of, of grapes. I had to have it. Um, that it wouldn't be up like this. It would be going across on the ground. And then they would put up the little poles like this, like this, just to keep the grapes off the ground. And the leaves would catch the water and then let it out to help water those grapes. But if it rained a lot and those grapevines had not been brought up, they would mildew and they would not produce good fruit. So the, the, the great farmer would come along and he would wash, he would wipe away, he would clean those vines. That is another interpretation, that as, if you're not bearing fruit, the, the vine grower would come along and bring you up. He, another interpretation, you would lift you up such that you could bear fruit. I think both are true. There are sometimes people decide not to follow and they turn their back on God. They themselves cut the branch off. They have made a decision not to follow God. And yet, this passage also says, God comes and lifts you up. God cleanses you, washes you with 
God's word. And as God prunes you, which is also the word for clean, as God prunes you, it's out of love. Because for you to do what you need to do, for the disciples to do what they needed to do, they had to be pruned in to be more single-minded. They had already left home. They had left family. They had decided to follow Jesus. The song, I have decided to follow Jesus. This is what the disciples decided to do. They followed Jesus. But as they continued with Jesus, there was pruning so that they could let the things that broke the relationship with Jesus to let that go. And as God prunes us, it's so important to lean into that. When the Holy Spirit touches your heart and says you need to give this up and we fight in the flesh, no, 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 no. But God does not want this to happen to us. God wants this for us. How many times have we felt that little nudge and we're like, that's not for me. I'm sure that's for somebody else. Or it's really not anything. And you, you navigate within your heart and you, you have this dialogue. Yeah, no, nah, mm -mm. Until he continues and you go, oh, okay, I gotta, I gotta give it up. And I'll just be forthright to you. A couple of weeks ago, I was having an real hard time with somebody I was working with, not Carol, love my, and it wasn't about, it wasn't about that uh, context, but I, it, in another part of my life, I was having a, a challenge with somebody, and God said, I just felt it in my heart, you don't need to be right, Robin, what, what? you don't need to be right, and I don't know, type A person. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a reason I'm assistant to the stated clerk for the presbytery because, you know, I, I, I do things right. And I, I don't like having other people tell me what to do. No, sorry. I know none of you have that challenge. So I had to repent and say, God, I'm so sorry that I have this need to be right. Help me not to have that need I give it over to you. Because God was pruning me. I could step back and let somebody else be right in their own way of being right. Right? In their own way. God was pruning me because God loves me. And God doesn't want me to continue to fight. God doesn't want us to have all that internal fighting within yourself. Because as, as one of the, the, the words in, in worship before was shame. Shame keeps us from doing what we're supposed to do. And shame keeps us from doing it how we're supposed to do it. So God was pruning me because I felt like I was righteous. And God's like, give it up. Okay. And my relationship with that person changed. And my husband alone, that was a miracle. Because I would, I would come home, I go, meh, 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 meh. I know none of you do that, but I'm like, meh, 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 meh. she thinks I'm like, meh, 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 meh. give it up, just give it up. So God prunes us because God loves us. God wants to open those hands when we say no. Remember in scripture, Who's, who's going to sit on the right side and the left side of Jesus? Seriously? That's what you're going to fight for right now? Really? Open your hands so that God can use you. So, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you joy. Joy for the journey because you're my friend. And that joy is something that goes deep within you. It's, it's the realization of the grace upon grace upon grace God continues to pour out upon us. 
that grace that is needed in those hard times. When you're able to step back and say, I don't have to be right. I don't have to be number one. I don't always have to speak. Even though sometimes I think I'm right, but you know, it's all okay. Really? Why are you fighting this, Robin? There's so many other sermons that can come out of this passage because it is so rich. And I invite you just to, uh, for this week, sit in this, in this passage. Think about how you are connected to God. Think about how, how you may remain on the vine. If I was to cut one of those, those, those little branches, this would happen. I was really sad. But immediately, this is what started to happen. Because I've got a, a vine in, the, in my backyard. Grapes don't grow very well. <laughs> I grow a lot of other stuff, but the the grapes don't grow as well. What grapes do you want to grow? What fruit do you want to grow? What fruit has God called you to grow? Jesus has called his disciples to go out and bear much fruit. Not just, oh, go out and bear a little fruit. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's bear fruit lasting fruit. Whatever God puts on your heart to serve, serve gladly. Wherever the Holy Spirit gives you a nudge, do it. Don't hold back. Don't do it to do it, but do it because God is calling you to do it. Do it because you're in relationship with God. And when you feel, the, the terminology is when you feel dry, right? What happens when you feel dry inside? The fact of being cracked, you know, that ground. You feel brittle. I, I, I'll feel reactive as opposed to responding. It's because I have not sat at the feet of Jesus. Mary, my first sermon, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She remained, she abided with Jesus. Her heart longed for that kind of relationship. People of Fullerton first. Where are you in your relationship to God today? Do you know who you are? Do you know what your identity is with Christ? Do you know whose you are? And then, do you know what you are about in the kingdom of God? What has God gifted you in? Where are your talents Where is your passion? Where do you see a need? We heard needs today. It might seem like a small thing to help out on the ninth. It's the ninth, right? It might seem like a small thing, but how much will it change one person? As the community comes, this is not just for you. It's for the community. This is is what the community will say. See, the song says, they will know me by your love. And as you are a beacon of light to this community, as you abide in Christ, and your roots go deep into that good soil, and you tend, you have to tend to that that plant, which is your relationship with God you will bear much fruit and fruit that lasts. Amen.
This is the Lord's table. We remember that during the time Jesus was in the upper room, it's when he started this. He started the sense of us gathering together as the people of God to remember. Whether it is remember bringing the members together, if it's in remembrance, and it isn't just a sense of, mm, I sort of remember, but it's Jesus is with us in this, this sacrament. And in this sacrament, we are nourished. We are able to, to bring in what the Holy Spirit has to give to us. So today, as we take communion, pause. Pause to consider what it is that you need from God today. Where do you need the nourishment of the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus is present with us to nourish through the Holy Spirit. On the night of Jesus' arrest, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this remembering me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant Sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As you drink of this cup, do this, remembering me. And whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks. Let us take the body of Christ together. The body of Christ given for you. This is always the time when I try to take the top off. Ha, Shazam. All right. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Please join your hearts as I lead us in prayer. Maker of heaven and earth, you are our help. We lift our eyes to you. As we walk this Lenten journey, you watch over our coming, you watch over our going, both now and forevermore. You are our shade and our protection. You keep us from all harm. We ask that you would strengthen and guide us as we do our work in this world, as we do our work in your world. Convict us of our disobedience and enable us to obey your call in our lives. Open our ears to the cry of the poor Teach us, dear Lord, to seek and to do justice, that we might stay in the path of your understanding 
and to pursue righteousness and your abiding love. Oh, Jesus, you know the anguish of our human lives. As one who sees the pain of those who suffer, we ask that you would bring comfort, that you would bring strength, that you would bring peace. As one who has experienced the agony and the tears of losing loved ones, Comfort all who grieve on this day. As one who wept over the faithlessness of your people, send your spirit to correct us in our unfaithfulness. As one who understands the agony of those who have been deserted, those who have been left behind, those who have been outcast. Stand alongside of those who feel so alone today, who feel abandoned, with no hope. And as you who is once forsaken, be with those who feel forsaken. Give hope and assurance to those who feel rejected. As one who knows the ravages of violence, God, we ask that you would bring peace and healing to those who are tortured by enemies. You, O oh Lord, have offered up prayers with loud cries and tears on our behalf, and our hearts do the same. Hear us, God, in our prayers. We approach your, gro- your throne of grace with boldness that grace would abide in our hearts and in our lives and that we might receive all the mercy, all the patience, all the strength, all the wisdom that we need in these days. Amen. And as the Lord guided people Let us join our hearts and our voices as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
thank you all for coming. Kathleen, would you throw up that Holy Week slide one more time, please? I just want to take a second to highlight our Holy Week services. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we'll have a regular service right at 930 on Thursday, April 14th, we'll have our Maundy Thursday service. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, Good Friday is the following night, the 15th, and also at 7 p.m. And then I hope you'll all invite people to our Easter services. On Easter Sunday, April 17th, those will both be at 9.30. One here and one over in Fellowship Hall. But now let's take a moment to uh, bless each other. So let's lift our hands. Ah, uh, yes, we have one more announcement that they've uh, reminded me of. There are Easter lily forms that are available so that you can uh, get an Easter lily to decorate the sanctuary. You can dedicate it to someone in particular. So feel free uh, as you walk out to uh, look for those forms. All righty, our benediction. Now go in peace. Happy Sunday, everyone.